Okay, it is, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Ron Krauss. Uh, Ron is a senior scientist and director of atherosclerosis research at the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute and also has appointments, academic appointments at UCSF, UC Berkeley, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And he'll be talking to us today about statins. So welcome, Ron. You have to use, you have to use this if you want to use a pointer, the side mouse. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, address this group uh, and describe uh, the third uh, in the series of the P50 pro programs that you're hearing about this morning. <clears throat> Ours, as shown here, is a systems approach to the pharmacogenomics of statin therapy. <clears throat> and you'll notice that, uh, unlike the previous projects, uh, this is a whole program uh, based on just one drug. So uh, before getting into uh, what we're actually doing and what we've had done <clears throat> that has led up to this uh, particular project, I wanted to provide some background uh, because this is an area uh, in clinical cardiology and, in fact, in all of clinical medicine uh, that has generated quite a bit of controversy uh, specifically related to the use of statins in very large populations uh, where we don't necessarily have the tools to predict either the beneficial outcome or potential adverse effects. And so that's really the overriding theme of our program is to dive in uh, to efficacy uh, and safety of statins. Uh, uh, and as I think m most of you know, uh, this is one of, one of the largest uh, prescribed, uh, most widely prescribed drugs uh, uh, of all, uh, certainly in a healthy population. I can't think of another drug that's been used in such a wide uh, swathe of the population because cardiovascular disease is, uh, remains the leading cause of death in this country. And statins are the most proven pharmacological means of reducing uh, that burden of disease. Um, and some of you may be aware that the controversy around uh, uh, who should be taking statins has been fueled by recent guidelines uh, from uh, a committee uh, that was charged to identify individuals and criteria for using statin treatment. And those criteria issued uh, in 2014 increased statin eligibility uh, by about 20 percent, which is, was already a very widely prescribed drug. So now something like 56 million uh, individuals in the U.S. would be considered candidates for therapy, he otherwise healthy individuals, m many of them. Uh, and as I look around this room, um, I don't know how many of you uh, either take statins or uh, have been told you might want to take statins, but it would be uh, a fairly large percentage. So this affects all of us, really. It affects the population uh, as well as us individually. Uh, and, and the science is still uh, very uh, poorly developed in terms of identifying with some precision those individuals who are most likely to benefit and most likely to have adverse events. And so uh, I could stop with this slide uh, to describe our P50 because this is the question in a nutshell. Uh, the uh, caption here is uh, statins, I got statins, who needs statins? Um, and so this is really what we're asking um, and we're doing it uh, hopefully in a more scientific way. So again, by way of introducing the scope of this program, uh, let's talk about uh, why, uh, why we need this in a little more detail, why we need to understand statin uh, responsiveness at a genetic level. Uh, and as I think you probably all know, that uh, statins are very effective. Everybody uh, knows this, both from uh, the promotions from the pharmaceutical industry as well as our U.S. guidelines, uh, that statins are effective. Um, but the net reduction in cardiovascular risk uh, rarely exceeds 30% in clinical trials, some of them a little bit more, some of them a little bit less. Uh, and there is a wide variation in the response of LDL cholesterol, which is uh, clearly the primary clinical biomarker uh, of statin efficacy. And so there is this considerable residual risk uh, on statin drugs uh, that results in, uh, again, the, the burden of heart disease, even in patients taking statins, being quite high. So clearly understanding the basis for this variation, uh, not just in uh, LDL response, but as we'll talk later in other uh, more clinically direct measures of statin uh, outcomes, uh, can help divide uh, a guide effective therapy, and uh, in our case also, 
a major portion of our program is focused on using genomics uh, for discovery, and that is discovery not just of very, a basis for variation in statin efficacy at the genetic level, uh, but other potential pathways in the pathways, uh, uh, therapies in the pathways uh, uh, on which statins act. Statin uh, targets, as I think many of you know, uh, the rate-limiting enzyme cholesterol synthesis, HMG core reductase. Uh, that's a very nice, precise target, uh, but as you'll see, there's many downstream consequences uh, and upstream regulators that can be teased out in a more pathway-based approach that could lead to discoveries of nodes in those pathways that may have uh, value uh, as being druggable. Um, now that's the efficacy. So. Uh, uh, our current program is much more focused on adverse effects uh, because this is beginning to play a greater role in uh, the decision process the clinicians need to use uh, in advising their patients to take statins, particularly otherwise healthy patients. Uh, what are the risks? And the risks, fortunately, are not high, but when you take the population under treatment and multiply it by the uh, percent likelihood of, a of developing uh, an adverse effect, uh, those numbers can be quite l large. Uh, so this is in the general terms called statin intolerance. The most common forms are a myopathy, which in its extreme case is quite rare, uh, rhabdomyolysis and renal failure uh, is one in you know, several million. Um, but more common myopathies, that is muscle weakness or impaired muscle function or pain, um, is, is quite a bit more prevalent, probably even more than the 5 to 10 percent shown here. And more recently, uh, many people are still not aware of yet another dimension to statin adverse effects, which uh, could have considerable downstream consequences, and that is uh, incident type 2 diabetes. That is non-diabetic individuals, some of them perhaps pre-diabetic, who take statins uh, can go on to develop statins, uh, and clinical trials have documented this, cohort studies have documented this. The overall risk is about 10% of statin users, and uh, there is some preliminary evidence that we developed that that might be a several fold higher uh, in, in otherwise healthy women exposed to statin. So there's some real uh, issues that come into play uh, when we talk to patients uh, and try to guide them towards preventative treatments, uh, and it would be much more effective if we could give them some genetic guidance as to their likelihood of benefit uh, versus risk, and that's what uh, that's what we're saying here, both in terms of the, whether they should use statins, the type or dose of statins, um, and ultimately that could have an important bearing on health care costs uh, in this country given the enormous burden that we have from cardiovascular disease. So um, again, I'm spending time on the rationale for this because uh, it is a little bit different from some of the other programs uh, in the PGRN because it is a single drug, but it's a single drug studied uh, in a large context, uh, and the systems approach is what we're taking in our P50. Uh, well, why is that? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned, statins uh, <clears throat> target a specific uh, uh, enzymatic mechanism in cholesterol synthesis, but there's lots of other things that go on. These are pleiotropic effects uh, on biological mechanisms and adverse effects and outcomes that are not attributable to lowering LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol reduction is, down, is way downstream of the HMG core reductase inhibition. So there's multiple disease processes that have been linked to statin use, as I think many of you know, and so it expands the domain from cardiovascular uh, to autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, cancer, particularly colon cancer, maybe breast cancer, uh, and CNS. Uh, either, uh, either it's good for your brain or it's bad for your brain, depending on which studies you look at, but there's a lot of interest in the role of cholesterol metabolism and statin effects uh, on cognitive function. Um, the statins do target uh, an enzyme, this enzyme, which has critical roles uh, in, a, in a lot of other pathways related to just cellular health, proliferative function, uh, apoptosis, um, you name it. Um, cholesterol is everywhere. Uh, so so when, when you start hitting cholesterol, you have to be prepared for a lot of other uh, things that the cells may uh, see as either problems or benefits. So uh, finally, why a systems approach, again, part of the rationale for all of this uh, is that uh, we traditionally start, and we, in fact, in our program did start, with uh, SNP association studies looking uh, primarily at uh, common variants associated with statin efficacy, and as I'll show you in a moment, we've done that for LDL cholesterol. Uh, 
but this GWAS approach in this case, because, in part because this is a complex disease itself that we're targeting with a drug that has many uh, diverse effects, uh, uh, this, uh, this association with single SNPs has yielded relatively little information on the determinants of statin response. So here is a paradigm that we started with actually in our earlier program, uh, which is called the PARC program, uh, with a trial uh, that illustrates a very uh, uh, prevalent uh, phenomenon in any drug response, and that is a range of responses ranging uh, from a big reduction in LDL cholesterol uh, to a small reduction or even an increase. So that's something that people don't always recognize. And this you know, well-controlled studies, compliance is controlled. Uh, so that range of response and looking at the extremes of the response um, uh, certainly provides a playing field to start interrogating the genetic uh, architecture of that variation. Uh, and so to make a, a, a long story short, uh, we spent a lot of time in our own program and collaborated ultimately with a, a larger uh, consortium um, of uh, statin trials and cohort studies uh, to see uh, uh, how much uh, variation we could explain uh, by screening uh, SNPs using GWAS. Uh, and despite the fact that there are heritable, there's considerable heritability to statin response, which I'll tell you about in a minute, the SNP approaches uh, really explained only a tiny percent, and that's been true in other uh, complex traits as well. Four loci uh, in almost 19,000 individuals, uh, summary data were used, so it's a little bit limited by that, not individual data, uh, but with replication, and this was published um, uh, a little bit over a year ago, uh, and that's pretty much it uh, for SNPs, so we've got to move on. So in our uh, previous grant, I'm going to describe the transition from our previous program, which was uh, the PARC group. Uh, many of those people are still working in our current uh, P50, the post-grant. Uh, uh, but I want to highlight in particular the work of Marissa uh, Medina, who is here, uh, who has led uh, an effort that's sort of taken us away uh, from uh, SNPs as the focus of the, our studies and uh, looking more at the biological uh, uh, responsiveness to statin uh, at the level of the transcriptome. Uh, and this initially exploited a, a clinical trial, the one I just mentioned, uh, in which we used simvastatin uh, to generate a series of phenotypes in response to statin, mainly LDL re reduction. Uh, in nearly a thousand individuals, and we immortalized uh, their lymphocytes initially um, as a repository for DNA. In those days, that was what you did. Uh, but we realized we had an opportunity to do something else, and that is uh, to relate um, the clinical responsiveness shown here uh, to the responsiveness of their lymphoblastoid cell lines, or LCLs, uh, to statins in vitro. And again, these are approaches that are being used uh, in patient-derived cells of other sources. This uh, is a, even uh, several people, uh, uh, and I'm sure many in this audience have used LCLs as well for other purposes. In fact, I know that's the case. Uh, but, in, but in this particular uh, paradigm, we're using simvastatin basically uh, at levels which uh, maximize a transcript transcriptional response um, and allow us to look at statin-induced uh, in vitro uh, changes, uh, not just at the transcriptome level, uh, but in other manifestations of gene expression. Uh, in these cells, intracellular cholesterol can be measured, enzyme activity, uh, LDL uptake, LDL receptor expression are all phenotypes that we have in an in vitro model that provide us quantitative measures of statin response that can then be linked uh, to the clinical response um, uh, in a computational mode. Um, and uh, the SNPs come into play uh, as well. So this is an integrative approach that is really based on this model, uh, and it's one that we've extended uh, from initially using microarray-based uh, expression data uh, now to RNA-seq, and we were able to start developing an RNA-seq uh, uh, repertoire uh, in these uh, statin-treated cell lines. Uh, this shows the results of the first 150. We now have uh, something like over 400 that we've been able to support through the PGRN uh, and the, uh, in part through the um, uh, RNA-seq um, resource. Uh, and this shows uh, really uh, in, the, in a clear way that using this uh, uh, volcano plot, um, uh, the genes that respond to statins either upregulated or downregulated, and the ones in yellow at the top are the ones you'd expect to see. These are ones related to cholesterol biosynthesis that are upregulated by statins. Uh, and I'll show you uh, in a moment the, the repertoire of gold categories that we've, been, uh, that we've identified uh, from the spectrum of response. Uh, but more importantly, um, using uh, 
a biological phenotype that's related to statin efficacy, the expression of LDL receptor protein in these cells uh, increased by uh, statin in vitro, uh, the magnitude of that response is really quite strongly related uh, to the magnitude of the in vivo reduction, in this case ApoB, the major LDL protein. Um, uh, there's a lot of scatter, but considering this is an in vivo uh, versus an in vivo result, it, it was reassuring and allowed us uh, to extend this approach to the project that I'll be describing to you um, uh, in, uh, in a few minutes as part of our P50 grant. Uh, but just to briefly summarize what we've done with this uh, LCL model, uh, we've been able to functionalize candidate gene variants, um, particularly HMG core reductase and LDL receptors. I'm not going to go through all the papers. Uh, we've identified some interesting um, uh, variants in genes that were not previously linked to cholesterol, uh, Rho A in particular and GAT M, which is involved in creatinine synthesis, energy metabolism. Uh, these are all, and this was a paper published in Nature a couple years ago. I'm not going to have time to go into those discovery projects. Um, other ones had to do uh, with variants that um, uh, uh, actually affected statin response per, per se. Um, and um, I'll talk about some of that work uh, in a moment because the signature genes that we identified provided the premise for our current program. Uh, and then we identified pathways uh, uh, using this transcriptomic approach that were novel uh, determinants of statin response, uh, the first of which is really alternative splicing, which uh, Marissa identified as one of her first projects in the lab. Um, and alternative splicing of HMG coi reductase and other genes, but HMG coi reductase in particular, uh, in statin treated cell lines, turned out to explain about uh, 12 or 13 percent of the in vivo variation in statin response. So all of a sudden, that one in vitro phenotype uh, involving a, a rather novel mechanism for deactivating HMG coi reductase uh, nailed uh, uh, a fairly significant percentage of clinical variation in LDL response. Well, here are some of the other pathways that showed up uh, using the RNA-seq data. Um, uh, these are the ones that are upregulated. A lot of them, as I mentioned, are certainly predictable based on the regulation, transcriptional regulation of statin uh, of cholesterol metabolism that uh, is upregulated uh, by SRBP. And uh, um, others involved in vesicular transport, which is what the LDL receptors do. So it's kind of nice uh, that we had uh, reasonable confirmation that this approach was uh, identifying biologically relevant pathways, and some of these are novel, and I won't have time to talk about all of them, uh, such as non-coding RNAs, which have turned out to be quite interesting. But here are some involving RNA processing and RNA splicing, again showing up by this agnostic approach uh, from the genome-wide analysis uh, that support what we had already shown uh, in our candidate gene studies. Uh, so. Um, uh, one of the things that was, I think, most productive and, and most informative for us that led to approach, the approach that we've taken in one of our current projects is the use of expression data to predict high versus low LDL response to statins. Uh, that is um, at the level of inherent variation uh, in cell lines, not statin-treated cell lines, uh, but just, uh, uh, just taking um, uh, these LCLs, incubating them under standardized conditions, uh, and looking at the transcriptome in a way that would allow us to extract uh, uh, pathways or, or clusters of genes that would be most predictive of response. Uh, this is something we've called the signature approach, and this is work carried out by uh, Pil Kim uh, in the lab, who uh, uh, was uh, uh, formerly a student of uh, Professor uh, Haiyan Yang at UC Berkeley Statistics, who helped us develop some fairly sophisticated uh, analytic techniques that I'll summarize very briefly. Um, and I will not try to explain in detail because I can't really claim to understand all the math. Um, however, uh, these, this, transcripti uh, this, this transcriptomic approach um, was taken and uh, in, 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 in condensed uh, from the full transcriptome uh, to a smaller number of questions uh, using uh, NMF, which is non-negative matrix factorization, and for those of you who are not familiar with that term, that's really just a way, uh, it, it's another way of clustering data to identify the minimal number of interrelated uh, gene expression uh, uh, traits uh, that could be used to explain uh, uh, a variation that we're looking for. Uh, and this identified the number of individuals that would be most informative uh, for identifying uh, those clusters 
uh, from this population, from the tails of this population. Uh, and so we chose, based on this analysis, 26 individuals from the high and low tails uh, from the distribution, and then um, developed a list of 100 uh, signature genes that were identified um, uh, using this approach uh, that best uh, differentiated the high versus low response, and for this we used a support vector machine, uh, which is, I think, a more generally used way of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, developing and, and testing statistical models for prediction of response. So that approach led to uh, a very nice result, and that is uh, that this 100 signature gene panel did differentiate quite nicely the high and low uh, responders based on LDL cholesterol. Uh, and here again, uh, another window into genetic variation response beyond uh, the SNPs themselves. Uh, 12 and three per, uh, over 12 percent of the variation in LDL response was explained uh, in the sample of uh, 372 individuals, and uh, we went on to validate and replicate uh, these findings using another approach, and that is to identify uh, EQTLs that um, uh, were from the literature associated with these hundred signature genes and. Uh, Pill came up with 36 uh, SNPs now. now. So we're moving back to SNPs, but in a much more constrained uh, universe of candidates, uh, not 20,000 genes, but uh, 100. So of these 36 uh, SNPs, uh, when they were put into a model without uh, any of the expression data, they alone explained 8.5% of the variance uh, in the tails of the uh, initial cohort. And then we had a second replication cohort uh, that actually turned out even better. So this is one of those cases of replication uh, actually improved uh, the predicted value up to 14.6% of the variance. And then when she put all of the information together, uh, signature genes and SNPs, uh, 36 EQTLs plus seven uh, identified from uh, various GWAS studies, um, uh, we upped the uh, variance uh, ever so much more to 15%. So again, a very substantial percentage of the variance uh, by these um, baseline uh, transcriptome uh, responses. We've also, and I won't have time to talk about this, looked at other sets of predictors based on statin responsive genes uh, in these in vitro settings. Uh, so we're building on this model to sequentially identify uh, genes and pathways in which those genes operate, uh, and then SNPs associated with those genes can become, can take us back uh, perhaps to clinical utility. And so the this approach, uh, I think, does have, we feel, and fortunately our reviewers agreed, uh, has some value in the predicting, uh, uh, predictive power um, using these signature genes and their EQTLs uh, to predict drug response. So uh, I want to close by uh, really now, at the end, um, <laughs> I'm now going to tell you what we're doing now. So I've uh, just been giving you sort of the transition from our prior program, which is a major transition. Um, for us, both in terms of science and, and, uh, and, and collaborating uh, investigators uh, that we brought together under the post-grant, uh, the uh, pharmacogenomics of statin response. And so this aims to use a multi-platform approach to identify genetic influences on clinical outcomes. Now we're moving uh, from a pretty uh, strong focus on uh, biomarkers, LDL, we looked at CRP, inflammatory markers, those are all biomarkers. Here we're going to the real thing. We've got to go to the disease. So we're looking at um, using these approaches to predict clinical cardiovascular events or, or to be associated with the prediction of clinical cardiovascular events as well as the adverse effects I described, type 2 diabetes and myopathy. So how are we going to do that? Well, again, it's a matter of pulling various platforms together. Uh, the key one, starting in our program, uh, led by Marissa, uh, is a transcriptomic approach, and we're bringing in a metabolomic element through one of our collaborators uh, um, uh, at Berkeley, Dan Nomura, uh, using these patient-derived cell lines, but not the ones we previously had, but those from individuals that we will be identifying from a clinical core uh, with our collaborators at Kaiser, uh, using EHR, uh, as you heard, um, was used at Vanderbilt. Similar approach, in this case, to identify uh, individuals with the requisite phenotypes, uh, cases and controls who are statin exposed, uh, uh, cases with CBD, diabetes, or myopathy on statins um, uh, to identify uh, initially transcriptomic approaches uh, in response, as I showed you uh, for the LDL cholesterol result. Uh, the second uh, project uh, is, an, is really a new one for us, and I think in some ways for pharmacogenomics in general. Um, and that is a collaboration with uh, Jake Lucis, who's my co-PI for this program at UCLA, uh, Karen Huey, who's a 
professor of genetics at UCLA, who developed, as I'll show some examples of this uh, in a moment, uh, a large and well-characterized panel of inbred mouse strains that have been extensively characterized uh, with relevant phenotypes of, in, uh, of interest to our program, as well as a, a huge amount of genetic data, both uh, uh, GWAS, uh, they're going for exomes, uh, they have um, expression arrays, they have um, the metagenome uh, from stool samples, so it's an amazing resource uh, to start uh, taking us into more mechanistic opportunities that we can't pursue uh, in humans at the tissue level. Um, and then the third major project led by Anil Risch um, at Kaiser is to go back to GWAS, but to do this using a large panel of uh, individual uh, patient-derived data. So there's uh, in their cohort of GWAS uh, uh, studied uh, individuals out of the Kaiser population, uh, there's about 46,000 statin users that we have available to us. So it's in the same uh, general dimension as what you've heard about uh, from BioView. But here we have, um, again, GWAS data uh, as well as uh, pharmacy data, the kind of thing that um, uh, you've heard about in the previous uh, talk that we are applying now to uh, annotate further uh, the pathways that we'll be identifying uh, in these other approaches, and then finally integrating these results uh, through a core informatics core led by Marilyn Ritchie, uh, who's now uh, at Geisinger, uh, to integrate these results using new informatic and visualization tools and, and take this to a level that might have applicability for systems approaches uh, to pharmacogenomics. So I just want to briefly touch on one of these projects uh, at the end here, genetic analysis in a large and well-characterized panel of inbred mouse strains, because this might be the least uh, familiar system uh, for you to uh, be thinking about. Uh, and this is using, again, high resolution genetic associations in a, a, a panel of mice, 100 uh, commercially available strains with lots of SNPs, uh, lots of data. Uh, and this is really a good system for looking at genetic uh, sources of variation. And in this case, there is quite a bit of information metabolically uh, related to uh, our aims, in this case, uh, HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin responsiveness in this strain, quite a range of variation. Uh, and GWAS has identified already uh, some loci that are being pursued. Uh, this is not a statin related uh, relationship, but it shows the power of being able to use this, um, in, these inbred mouse, mice strains as, uh, to, to identify relevant phenotypes. And in our case, now we're looking at statin response. So uh, we're starting to generate data with Karen Rue in particular. Uh, in these mouse strains showing variation in statin responsiveness at the level of glucose and insulin. Um, some strains showing uh, an impaired response uh, with reduced um, uh, glucose uh, and uh, hyperinsulinemic response, others with no effect, and others uh, who have uh, an improved uh, glucose response to insulin. So this is intrinsic genetic variation in exactly the phenotype we're interested in, and this is where we're going to take this to the genetic level. Uh, and then the second phenotype is also something we can address in mice in a way that we don't quite have the tools yet to do in humans, or at least to do so would be very expensive. Uh, but to look at grip strength is, uh, in mice treated with statins as a manifestation of muscle uh, pathology. And here again, there's variation response, some showing improvement, uh, uh, others showing uh, more the more common adverse effects. So again, lots of variation um, that can be explored. And so we really don't have yet anything to report. Um, uh, this is just getting started, and it's really a new dimension to us. So here, finally, is the way uh, what I've described for you and the way we've integrated it and the people that are responsible for the various uh, components of this post-grant cellular models led by, led by Marissa, Dan Amura, Debbie Nickerson, Ida Chen at LA Biomed, uh, Project 2 led by uh, Jake and Karen at UCLA, Project 3 led by Neil uh, Kaiser uh, uh, and uh, Carlos Irabarn at Kaiser, who's uh, also directing our clinical core, uh, providing samples uh, for uh, Projects 1 and 3. And then in the end, we're going to pull this all together, we hope, uh, through these computational approaches. So I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Wolfgang. All right, Alan, uh, very nice. So um, you, you mentioned uh, correctly that statins are highly effective in preventing cardiovascular events, but only in a portion of patients. So there's a lot of activity now 
in adding other drugs right. you know, and other treatments, right. and they're all pretty much related to lipid right. metabolism, that's right. let's say CTP inhibitors and so on. So do you think we are maxed out with statins in terms of targeting lipids? And what strategy do you think is the best to try to combine statins with other drugs, let's say affecting the immune system or uh, Right. All the right. elements. Right. Well, yeah. So thanks. Yeah. So uh, I, I briefly mentioned, and, and you bring out uh, the complexity of cardiovascular disease. It's not just about lipids, although, as you point out, also uh, the actionable phenotypes to prevent and manage cardiovascular risk are lipids for, so far. There are a couple of trials uh, that are going to be reported out fairly soon using immune therapy exclusively um, that will test the idea that inflammatory processes and controls of those uh, with non-statin drugs uh, may, may have a role. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for pharmacogenetics there, and Paul Ritker is actually leading both of those studies. He's been associated with our program in the past, and these are, if they look like they're effective in any way, uh, they can add to the understanding of the genetic architecture of statin, uh, of, uh, of drug response in general, of multiple drug response. Uh, and there's PCSK9 inhibitors, which we're starting to look at. So there's a lot going on. It's a, it's a field that continually generates new possibilities, but it absolutely involves going ultimately beyond statins, because I think we probably have maxed out on statins. Nice talk, Ron. I uh, want to go back to your EQTL uh, work where you identified these 36 SNPs in your 100 genes. I'm wondering how many of those actually fall in non-coding space? Do they make sense from potential um, promoter enhancer locations, et cetera? Uh, their specific locations I can't pull out uh, of, uh, of my brain right now. Marissa, do you, do you recall how many were actually function, known to be functional? So some part of what we're after, and it's not what you asked, but I'll just mention that uh, uh, we're also intending to use exomes uh, at some point in this program. Um, but mo much of what we're dealing with in this uh, statin response uh, phenotype is, is regulatory, and so, we, and so that's why I think the EQTLs and the non-coding uh, regulatory regions are going to be really important. Okay, okay thank you.